Appendicitis. One of the most common, if not the most common reason for general surgery in the United States. An incredibly important topic for anybody involved in surgery, whether you're a medical student, resident, or a practicing surgeon. Today we're going to be talking about the workup of appendicitis. From the history to the physical exam, the labs you need in the imaging, we're going to get to it all. Let's do it. Welcome back to Citizen Surgeon. My name is Dr. Eric Pearson. I'm a pediatric surgeon and I'm here to get you comfortable on the wards, in the ICU, in the operating room, and of course to crush your exams. Today we're talking about appendicitis. If you watched the last video, you are comfortable with knowing what the appendix is, the anatomy, the physiology, maybe a few kind of fun facts, rabbits, tamarins, snakes, reptiles. You know, it was a great talk. So if you haven't got a chance to read that, or watch that talk, check that out. Also, if you want more of these videos, hit that subscribe button, give it a like, share it with your friends. Let me know that you're finding value because that's what keeps it going. All right, so appendicitis, hugely common surgical problem. In fact, as a pediatric surgeon, I'm asked almost every single day to go down to the emergency room and rule out appendicitis or make a decision that a child might need their ap appendix removed, okay? So how do I do that? How do I go down and work up appendicitis? I'm gonna share with you my approach to it today. We're gonna go through the H&P, we're gonna go through the labs that I need and the imaging that I need, if any, to make that decision to operate or not operate. In the next video, we're gonna go through the management of appendicitis. I'm gonna talk about some of the new data out there about the non-operative approach, how successful that is in both adults and children, and I'm gonna talk about the operative methods that we can use to remove somebody's appendix. So let's get into it. Let's go into the workup of appendicitis. So first, two references I want you to check out. Number one is Sabiston's textbook of surgery. So. One of the Bibles, one of the great references, if you're a medical student interested in surgery or a surgical resident that is studying surgery, no matter what country you're in, Sabiston's is an awesome reference. I got a link to it in the description below, so check that out. The second one, required reading, I think for every medical student, is Zachary Cope's Diagnosis of the Acute Abdomen. You gotta read this one. It has a great historical perspective and it really goes through my approach and how I do that history and physical exam, things that I look for, whether it's the periodicity of pain, the duration of pain, all those really subtle characteristics that are gonna point you in the direction of a particular diseased organ and the chapter on appendicitis is particularly helpful. So check out that reference as well. All right, so let's get into it. What is the appendix? Well, I've already told you what the appendix is in the last video, so check that out. What is the appendix and what does it do, okay? We talked about biofilms. We talked about the immunological function of the appendix. We talked about the structure. We talked about how it can be helpful and we want to jump into appendicitis. First, we got to know, well, what is the pathophysiology? So the pathophysiology of appendicitis is generally agreed to to be luminal obstruction of the appendix, okay? So you can see in this diagram here, if we have luminal obstruction, what does that mean? That means the mucus can't get out, but it's gonna continue to be produced by those goblet cells, those mucin-producing cells, the enterocytes of the appendix, okay? And so you get continued mucin production, all right? But it can't get out, so the pressure is gonna go up. When the pressure goes up, we're gonna get ischemia to the appendix, okay? When we get ischemia, we're gonna get some bacterial development. We also have that static mucus. So we have overproduction of bacteria, we have ischemia of the appendix, and that's gonna to lead to bacterial translocation across the appendiceal wall. That's why we can get that purulent exudate around the appendix after about 24 hours of appendicitis or 24 hours of luminal obstruction. And eventually the appendix dies. We get a hole in it. And that's what we call complicated appendicitis or perforated appendicitis. Okay, so that's the pathway. Luminal obstruction, 
overproduction now of mucus in this small area that's constrained, increased pressure, decreased perfusion, ischemia, and then cell death. Now, what can cause that obstruction? So, number one is you can have a fecalith or a little calcified piece of poop. I'll, I'll say that to parents, I'll say it's a poop stone, okay? You can also have vegetable matter. You can even have, in some parts of the world, there are worms that can cause luminal obstruction of the appendix. And of course, in rare conditions, you can have a cancer that causes luminal obstruction. Most commonly, that would be a carcinoid, but also adenocarcinoma, like a mucinous adenocarcinoma can cause luminal obstruction. You can also have vegetable material or foreign bodies that could possibly cause luminal obstruction. Now, if we don't have a physical plug, we also get luminal obstruction by lymphoid hyperplasia or overgrowth of those lymphoid follicles I talked about in that last video. And that will cause luminal obstruction and set off this cascade of events that leads to appendicitis. Now we know that appendicitis is a polymicrobial infection. So two different types of bacteria, anaerobic and aerobic. The most common anaerobic bacteria is bacterioids fragilis. When we look at the aerobic bacteria, we have a range. So that could be Escherichia coli. We could have strep viridans. We could have Klebsiella pneumonia and others, okay? So just remember, polymicrobial infection. And so when we get perforated appendicitis or even non-perforated appendicitis, we have to make sure that we're covering this range of bacteria. So who gets appendicitis? So we have here male and female. So what is more common? Well, males typically have appendicitis more commonly than females, all right? And a lifetime risk of appendicitis, what do you think that is? 2%, 10%, 20%, 30%? Well, the lifetime risk for a male is 8.6%, and that is greater than the lifetime risk of a female at just over 6%. Now, when we look when in life does appendicitis occur, it's most common in the second and third decade of life but it also has a bimodal distribution. So we see a peak early in life, that second and third decade, okay? But we also see a peak later in life, around the seventh decade, okay? So bimodal distribution, but most common in that second and third decade of life. So now let's get into the workup. We are confident in what the appendix is. Now we got that pathophysiology. So take those into consideration when we think about this workup. So, what does every workup start with, okay? It starts with a history and physical examination. So the history in appendicitis focuses on what? It focuses on pain. Pain is usually the first symptom in appendicitis. And so how do we figure out pain in any patient? We ask 10 questions, and those are S-R-N-O-P-D, Sarah, all right? Now, if you haven't checked out my acute abdomen video, check that out, and I talk about how I evaluate pain and I ask these questions. So that is site, radiation, nature, onset, periodicity, duration, severity, aggravating, relieving, and associated. All right, so what does that look like in a patient with appendicitis? Well, it might look something like this. A 12-year-old presents with right lower quadrant pain that's non-radiating, it is crampy in nature. It started this morning in the central abdomen. It's constant with no periodicity. It reaches an eight or nine out of 10. It's aggravated by pushing and moving, all those bumps in the road on the way over. It's relieved with rest, and it's associated with nausea, loss of appetite, and vomiting with a low-grade fever. Now, hearing all those things in that nice, concise bullet, I would say, this is most likely appendicitis, but we will talk about that possible differential, okay? So SRNOPD, Sarah, that's how I like to ask those pain questions, and that's what it might look like in a child with appendicitis or even an adult. But keep in mind that the presentation can be atypical, all right? So take the appendix that's in a retrocecal location. So it's kind of hiding out in the retroperitoneum. So you're not gonna get that central to right lower quadrant migration, all right? The reason that we get right lower quadrant pain, the reason, reason that we can locate it there is because when the, the appendix itself becomes 
inflamed and you get that purulent debris around the outside and it causes local inflammation in the anterior abdominal wall, we can feel that, all right? When the appendix is just distended, we can't locate that. So that goes to the vagus nerve or the dermatome right around the belly button, the 10th dermatome, okay? And that's where we would locate pain from abdominal distension. But when it gets inflamed and it starts to irritate the anterior abdominal wall, we can locate the right lower quadrant. So that patient with a retrocecal appendicitis, they might not present with that. They may present with back pain and low-grade fever, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, and this might be going on for two or three days because it's atypical, all right? So just remember, we're gonna have our typical kind of barn door history for appendicitis, but there's also some subtle stuff, so we have to keep our antennas super sharp when we're doing our history and our physical exam. Now, how about that physical exam? Well, like I talked about in that acute abdomen video, Every physical exam starts with observation, okay? And my observation acronym is CHANDLER. And that stands for color, hydration, alertness, nutrition, disability, limbs, external support, and respiratory distress. So I can go up and stand at the end of the bed and I can say, okay, this child has good color or are they pale, are they jaundiced, okay, are they well hydrated, do they have moist mucous membranes, are they alert and talking to me, are they lethargic, do they have good nutritional status, or are they cachectic, with disability, are they grossly neurologically intact, with limbs, are their limbs symmetrical, are they well perfused, for external support, what external support are they on, is it just an IV bag, or are they intubated, are they on a ventilator, are they on any um, vasoactive medications? Are they getting any other drips like TPM? And then for respiratory distress, are they calm and speaking to me in full sentences? Or are they working hard using accessory muscles of respiration and not able to complete full sentences? So that's my observation. Once we get past that, I'm going to be able to say, is this kid sick or not sick? Okay, Chandler is going to give me that. And then I can move on. And for the abdomen, with appendicitis, I usually start with light palpation. I'll always ask a child and their parent permission to feel their abdomen. I'll ask them to point with one finger, where does it hurt? And then I start in the area opposite that. So if they point and they say, man, it hurts right here. I'm going to start in the left upper quadrant very lightly. Usually I'll get down on one knee just so my hand is at even playing field, I'm not applying any pressure, and I'll gently feel that opposite area, the left upper quadrant. And then I'll move down to the left lower quadrant, across to the right upper quadrant, and then finally, just ever so slightly, very gently over that area that hurts, okay? If we go right to the area that hurts, we're really not gonna pick up other subtle findings in the exam. So. For example, if I push down the right lower quadrant and it hurts and the patient's grimacing, number one, I've lost a little trust in that child. I've lost trust of the parents too. But also, if I want to feel the other area of the abdomen and see, okay, do they have just focal peritonitis or do they have generalized peritonitis? If I've already made a child hurt or an adult hurt by pushing that area that's the most tender, they're going to flex. When the, on that other side, I might not be able to pick up the difference between voluntary or involuntary guarding or no guarding, all right? So I'll start with light palpation. I typically don't go to deep palpation for appendicitis, but what I do is I will go to the left lower quadrant, I'll gently push in and then release my hand to elicit rebound tenderness. Often, a child will feel that pain in the right lower quadrant when I release my hand from the left lower quadrant. Okay, do you guys know what that sign's called? All right, that sign has a particular name, and I'll tell you that at the end of the video. And just those two things will give me a good idea of does the history fit with the physical exam for appendicitis. I typically, like I said, won't go to deep palpation. A child with retrocecal appendicitis may have some pain in that costodiaphragmatic angle on that right side, okay? So I will gently push back there and that might give me an idea if I don't have any imaging of where the appendix might be. Now, what are some other physical exam signs that are consistent 
with appendicitis? Well, we have the obturator sign, okay? So for the obturator sign, we're gonna flex up that right leg and we're gonna have pain on internal rotation at the hip joint because we're putting a stretch on that obturator internus where the appendix may be sitting and that can elicit a discomfort. In addition, we have psoas sign. So when we extend the right hip, we can get pain and discomfort because the appendix is sitting on that psoas muscle. And then I said I was gonna tell you at the end of the video, I'm gonna tell you right now, pain with rebound tenderness where you release on the left side, you feel on the right side, that's called Robsing sign. All right, so those are some additional physical exam signs that can help confirm that diagnosis of appendicitis. So when we think about the differential for acute appendicitis, given the history and the physical exam, we have to think about all the different organs in the abdomen. So the colon and the small bowel, we have to think about inflammatory bowel disease. Could it possibly be a Meckel's diverticulitis? A common problem would be mesenteric adenitis. So those lymph nodes down in the right lower quadrant, when they enlarge and are inflamed, that can give you a, a similar story to appendicitis. If it's an adult, is it possible that it's diverticulitis or even malignancy? We have to think about the urinary tract. So kidneys, ureter, bladder. Could it be pyelonephritis? Could it be nephrolithiasis or kidney stones? Or could we have a urinary tract infection? I put a picture of the stomach here, uh, but that's all of the small bowel. And that is, could this be an acute gastroenteritis? It's important to do a testicular exam in young men that present with acute abdominal pain because abdominal pain is a sign of possible testicular torsion. So we wanna rule that out. And then in females, we have to think about gynecological problems like ovarian cysts or ovarian torsion ectopic pregnancy, endometriosis, middle schmerz, okay? So a range of problems to think about for the differential diagnosis of appendicitis, and I didn't even get to all of them here. I just hit the highlights. But it's really important to start to narrow down that differential with those questions in your history and with those particular moves in your physical exam. So let's move on to labs. What labs do you think would be most important in evaluating appendicitis. I think the most important labs are number one, a CBC, number two is a CRP or C-reactive protein, and number three is a basic metabolic profile, okay? Now, a CBC, we're gonna look for an elevated white cell count, we're gonna look for a left shift in that white cell count. So do we have a left shift or more neutrophils in that white cell count? which is a finding in acute appendicitis. When we look at the CRP, usually we will see an elevation in the CRP in people that present with acute appendicitis. And so if I have a young person that has a normal CRP, acute appendicitis is gonna drop down on the differential list and I'm gonna think about other things that are non-inflammatory. So for example, constipation can be a very common cause of abdominal pain in both kids and adults. And a BMP, this is important, so we can see, well, does our patient have acidosis? So they may have a decrease bicarbonate in that example. You know, are we profoundly dehydrated? Do we have an increased buonin and creatinine, some renal failure from inability to take in PO, perhaps persistent vomiting over a period of days, all right? So CBC, CRP, and BMP, I think those are the three essential lab tests in working up a patient for appendicitis. Now, if you have somebody that's even more sick, perhaps they're in septic shock, now you might want an arterial blood gas. Do we need more aggressive resuscitation before surgery if that is indeed the decision we're gonna make, okay? So, what imaging now can we use to help us make the diagnosis? Well, how about plain films? What can they tell us? Well, about 5% of people can have a visible fecal lift on a plain film. Now, I don't think plain films are particularly helpful in diagnosing acute appendicitis, but they can be helpful in, for example, showing me that a person or a child is constipated with significant fecal burden, all right? Also important for diagnosing a small bowel obstruction. Do we have dilated loops of bowel and air fluid levels? If we have free air on a plain film, especially an upright film or a left lateral decubitus, okay? We're gonna think about something else because usually appendicitis doesn't give you a large volume of free air. 
So the plain film can be helpful, especially in the acute abdomen, but not particularly if you're appendicitis. For other things, bowel obstruction, free air, and of course, looking at a fecal, uh, fecal burden or stool burden and constipation. So what else? What other imaging things are helpful? Well, how about ultrasound? Ultrasound is the modality of choice for diagnosing appendicitis. This is non-radiating, okay, no ionizing radiation, very safe. It is dependent on the skill of the ultrasonographer and on the interpretation of the radiologist, but ultrasound is an awesome modality for diagnosing appendicitis. And an ultrasound might look something like this. So we can see, I'm gonna give you a little arrow of condescension here. So you can see the appendix on this film. Then if we switch into kind of a cross section, we can see that this is a dilated and inflamed appendix. We can even see a fecal lith right here, all right? And you can see how that fecal lith is casting a shadow, all right? So that's appendicitis with a fecal lith present. So how sensitive, how accurate is ultrasound when looking at appendicitis? Well, we can see that it is fairly sensitive, okay? So about 84% sensitivity, but it is very specific. So 96% specificity for diagnosing appendicitis. Now the positive predictive value falls around 90% and the negative predictive value is about 93%, all right? So you can see here that ultrasound is a very good test for appendicitis, especially if you have a positive finding. Now, one of the problems with the ultrasound is what do you do with a non-diagnostic test? So a lot of times the appendix will not be able to be visualized. And that can be almost up to 60% of ultrasounds. So in that case, we look for secondary signs. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But even in these cases of non-diagnostic ultrasounds, up to half of patients will still have acute appendicitis. And one kind of rule of thumb to keep in mind is if you have a normal white cell count or a white cell count less than seven and a half and a non-diagnostic ultrasound, the negative predictive value of appendicitis is very high. So it's very unlikely that somebody has appendicitis. And especially if a patient has a normal CRP. So when we look at ultrasound, what are some direct and indirect or secondary signs of appendicitis? So one is non-compressibility. So if you have a non-compressible tubular structure in the right lower quadrant, that's a direct sign of appendicitis. We also look for diameter. So I talked about that a little bit in what is the appendix video. So a diameter greater than six millimeters or greater than or equal to seven millimeters is a direct sign of appendicitis. An appendiceal wall thickening of greater than three millimeters, hypervascularity of the appendix, or an appendicolith present. Okay, those are all direct signs associated with appendicitis. Now, you can have fecaliths present in a normal appearing appendix, okay? And that is not necessarily appendicitis, but we will have a conversation on whether that appendix needs to come, that needs to come out or not based on the symptoms of the child. But let's talk about secondary signs. So what are some secondary signs? So secondary signs might be free fluid around the appendix or in the right lower quadrant, a localized abscess in the right lower quadrant, the right flank or the pelvis. Increased echogenicity of the fat is a secondary finding. And then thickened peritoneum or enlarged local lymph nodes in that area. These are all secondary signs. Okay, so on the ultrasound report, you may have findings of direct signs, and you may also have findings of these secondary signs. And so if you can't visualize the appendix, you have a non-diagnostic ultrasound, pay attention to these secondary signs, and that's going to help you narrow down your differential diagnosis. Now, before I go to cross-sectional imaging, I want to talk about clinical prediction rules. So clinical prediction rules are when we collect findings together, whether it's from the history of the physical exam, the labs and imaging, we give those findings a particular score, and then we take that score and stratify it to establish risk. Okay, so the most common clinical prediction rule that we have in appendicitis is the Alvarado score, okay? Now the Alvarado score is a set of 10 points, okay? And you can see them all here. So we have migration of pain, we have anorexia, we have right lower quadrant, tenderness, a lot of different findings. And those will be given a value 
and we can add that up and take it out of 10, and that's gonna help us risk stratify. So what does that stratification look like? Well, we can say if we have a score of zero to three, that's low risk, four to six is medium risk, and greater than seven, greater or equal to seven, is gonna be high risk for appendicitis. Now, how does that help us? Now, we can usually rule out appendicitis if that score is less than four. If the score is seven or greater, then often the emergency department will call the surgeon without any cross-sectional imaging and say, hey, I have a child with an Alvarado scar of eight. Uh, I'd like you to come down and evaluate for a possible appendicitis or another pathology in the abdomen. Now, if the score is four to six, we have a medium risk. And so in those child we, children, we might want to either observe in-house or get further cross-sectional imaging. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So you can see here that the risk of appendicitis for the score of less than four is 3.7%, so it's unlikely to be appendicitis. If you have a score of four to six, it's 45%. We're going to need more data. And a score of greater than seven has an 87% risk of appendicitis. So that's when we'll usually get the surgeons involved and they'll make a decision whether we need to take that person or that child to the operating room for a laparoscopic appendectomy, or perhaps treat that child or that adult non-operatively with antibiotics. Now in this next slide, I'm gonna show you some different clinical prediction rules that are helpful in appendicitis. And you can see here, so we have our Alvarado score all the way on screen left. Okay, that's the one we just talked about. We also have the pediatric appendicitis score right there in the middle. And then over on screen right, we have the appendicitis inflammatory response score. So these are just different clinical prediction rules that you should get comfortable with so you can use them in your decision-making process when you're trying to make a diagnosis of appendicitis. Now, one thing I think that is very important is when considering appendicitis, these clinical prediction rules are so helpful that I think every patient should get a score. And if you're not using these at your institution, I recommend getting a quality improvement team together so you can start using a score, and that's gonna do a couple of things. Number one, that's gonna decrease your use of cross-sectional imaging. So it's gonna decrease CT utilization. It's gonna decrease MRI utilization. It's also gonna get the surgeons involved earlier in the decision-making process, and that's gonna facilitate a little quicker care. Okay, so think about clinical prediction rules when you're trying to care for appendicitis or appendicitis pathway. So what other data is available? All right, this brings us to cross-sectional imaging. So let's say you have that kid or that adult with a Alvarado score of five, all right? So we need more data. Now, historically, we would get a CT scan for cross-sectional imaging, all right? And this would be with IV contrast so we could see the bowel, the bowel wall, differentiate it from, for example, an abscess or other bowel, okay? So CT scan with IV contrast historically would be that next step to get more data. Now, the sensitivity and specificity of CT scan with appendicitis is really high, approaching 100%. But the problem is what? The problem is a CT scan uses ionizing radiation. And in children, ionizing radiation, especially in children under the age of five, may lead to a higher risk of cancers later in life. So if we need more cross-sectional imaging and we're not gonna use CT, what can we use? Well, we can use magnetic resonance imaging or contrast-enhanced MRI. And I have a reference right here, MRI is very, very helpful in diagnosing appendicitis if you do need more data. So in pediatrics, we really want a race to zero or a race to zero utilization of CT scan for cross-sectional imaging because of that radiation risk, okay? Now, when I'm faced with this dilemma of a, a Alvarado or a pediatric appendicitis score right in the middle and we need more data, I'll either make a choice that I'm convinced it's appendicitis and on my physical exam and with the thousands of kids I've examined, I feel comfortable and we can proceed with laparoscopic appendectomy and I can send the parents and uh, get a scent from the child. Okay, that's option number one. Number two is observe the child without treating with antibiotics overnight in the hospital and 
Appendicitis is always progressive, so that pain will usually always get worse. And if that's the case, then, the, then appendicitis is very likely will start antibiotics, resuscitate, and go for surgery or a non-offered approach. And we'll talk about those two things next week. And then the third option is I'll get either a CT scan or an MRI if indeed that's available and I can get that to assist with the diagnosis. Now at the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston, they do an amazing job with quality improvement in pediatric surgery. And they put out this paper approaching zero, and that is with clinical prediction rules and ultrasound and MRI, they've gone to basically zero utilization of CT scan, and that should be the goal, okay? So review that paper, I'll put that reference in the uh, details below, okay? So today, we talked about appendicitis. I went through the pathophysiology, I went through the history, the exam, we went through the labs, and then we talked about imaging. We also talked about clinical prediction rules and how those can be helpful. And then finally, we talked about CT scan and MRI and how we really should be approaching zero with our utilization of CT scans, especially in children. And MRI is very sensitive and specific for diagnosing appendicitis. Okay, all the references from today are gonna be in the description below. If you like this, make sure to subscribe, give it a like, give it a share, make a comment. I love engaging with you guys. And as always, study hard, be safe. I'll see you next time.